so far, the only way we have to determine if a cycle meets the second law is first we can find the efficiency of the actual cycle, and then we can find the efficiency of the Carnot cycle. And we know that if the that the efficiency of the Carnot cycle is the highest efficiency possible. Like that's basically the ideal cycle. So you can't have an efficiency higher than that. So if the efficiency that you calculate for your real cycle or actual cycle ends up being higher than the efficiency for the Carnot cycle operating between the same two temperatures, then you know that your system or whatever it is you're proposing violates the second law and it's not going to work. What we want is a method to where we can determine if a cycle meets the second law without like we want one method to determine if the cycle meets the second law. We don't want to have to calculate the efficiency for the Carnot cycle and then the efficiency for our cycle. We just want one equation that we can use to verify or to see if the if our cycle meets the second law. So what the what we're going to use is called the Clausius inequality. So what I want to do is go through the derivation of the Clausius inequality and then we'll kind of see how it works. So let's assume that we have a reversible cycle, our source our sink, so it's T low, and then have amount of Q high, Q low, the heat that we have to dump, and then we have a we're getting a certain amount of net work out. And I'm going to specify that this is reversible. So this is work that's this is work that's associated with a reversible cycle. So what we want to do is we want to integrate over the entire cycle. But what we're going to be integrating is this. So this just says that we're integrating over the entire cycle. That's what that circle on the integral sign is. Then we have delta Q over T. Where this delta Q over T came from, um, if we look at if we look at this, so we know that the efficiency is equal to the network because that's what we want. So the network out over what we have to put in. So we're putting in Q in. And then this is equal to Q in minus Q out. And you can get this Q in minus Q out by integrating over the cycle for the work. Or actually, you just, um, so you, you go back to the first law equation, integrate, and you get the work is equal to Q in minus Q out. So I recommend doing that if you're not sure where that comes from. And then this can be rewritten as 1 minus Q out over Q in, and then for a reversible cycle, Q out over Q in can be rewritten as TL over T high. And so what we can do is we can say, well, Q out over Q in is equal to TL over T high. And so therefore, Q out over T low is equal to Q in over T high. So anyway, this, this is where this Q over T comes from for this Clausius inequality integration. What we're going to do is integrate this. If we integrate this, we get that... Well, first we're going to kind of split this up because we know that this is Q high over T high minus Q low over T low. So it's Q high over T high minus Q low over T low. 
And so then this is just equal to q high over t high minus q low over t low. So we've just integrated over this cycle for this reversible um, system. In a reversible cycle, so for a reversible cycle, t high over t low is equal to q high over q low. What we can do is we can rearrange this equation a little bit so that we have q high over t high and q, q low over t low. So q high over t high is equal to q low over t low. And then what I'm going to do is plug this into there. So if I do that, I get the q low over t low minus q low over t low is equal to zero. What this means is that thus we can say that if we integrate over the cycle of dq t, this is equal to zero. And I want to make sure that, so this is for a reversible cycle only. All right, so we've done this for a reversible cycle. Now let's do this for an irreversible cycle. So ir reversible cycle. So we're going to have um, t high. So we have our source, we have our sink. So this is t low. And then q high, q low. And we have a certain amount of work out. A reversible cycle. So a reversible cycle is basically the ideal cycle, like the reversible cycle is, means that there's no friction, there's no losses, there's like everything is perfect. And we know that, or everything is ideal. And we know that that can't really exist in real life. And we also know that everything that, that is real, so like this, where this is irreversible, so this is like the real system, it can't have, so, for a reversible cycle, there's going to be more work output and less heat rejection than for an irreversible cycle. Let me just write that down. So we know that reversible cycles will have more work output and less heat rejection than irreversible cycles. The way that we can write that mathematically is we can say that the efficiency of a reversible cycle, and this is something we already knew, we're just kind of stating it, the efficiency of, an of a reversible cycle is greater than the efficiency of an irreversible cycle. And that makes sense because we had already said that a reversible cycle or the Carnot cycle has the highest possible efficiency. So you can't have an efficiency higher than that. If you had an efficiency higher than that, you would violate the second law. So... We can also write, since, the, since we know that the efficiency is equal to 1 minus QL over Q high, we can rewrite this equation as 1 minus QL over QH. And we're going to say this one is the reversible one. So it's greater than 1 minus QL over QH, and this one is the irreversible one. This is where things are, are a little bit interesting. So it looks like, well, we have the same equation, so um, how are they not just the same? Well, here's how. So both
both of the cycles have the same Q high. Like we have a, our Q high. Like whatever our Q high is, it's what it is. So both, I'm going to specify both reversible and irreversible have the same Q high. So the only term that we can change here is QL. And so the only way for the reversible to be larger is if QL is smaller. And so what I'm going to specify here is that QL is smaller and over here QL is larger. So basically we can write this like this, that QL reversible is less than QL irreversible. So really what we're saying here is that for an irreversible process, we have to dump a larger amount of heat in order for our system to work. So we know that for a reversible process, so we know that Q high over T high minus QL over TL is equal to zero. And I'm going to specify that this is for a reversible process because if, it, if your process is irreversible, it's not equal to zero. So this is equal to zero. And so then for an irreversible process, then we know that Q high over T high minus Q low over T low is less than zero. And this is for an irreversible process. It looks like we're kind of going through a bunch of math here and maybe walking in some circles, but let's get to the point of why this is important. So why, why do we care about this? Like, why is this important? So let's look at this. So let's integrate over the cycle of del Q T for an irreversible process. This is going to be equal to delta Q over TH minus delta Q low. And this is should be high here over T low. And this is for a, I'm going to specify that this is for an irreversible process. So then this equals Q high over T high minus Q low over T low for an irreversible process. So basically, and so then if we compare this equation to this equation, we've basically just shown that delta dQ over T irreversible is less than zero. We can only have a reversible or irreversible cycle. So like there's nothing else. There's only a reversible or an irreversible. So what we can do is we can say, well, if we have D del Q over T, this has to be less than or equal to zero for any cycle. So this is called the Clausius inequality. How we can use this is if del Q, if, so if we calculate the left hand side and if it's less than zero, we know that this is an irreversible process or cycle. So we know it's an irreversible cycle. So we know that it basically it's a real cycle, doesn't violate the second law, should be good. If it's equal to zero, we know that this is a reversible, or it could be internally reversible. This is basically the ideal cycle. And if it's greater than zero, we know that this violates the second law, and therefore it's impossible. This is really convenient because it gives us one equation that we can use to determine if the second law has been violated. So let's look at an example. Let's say that, so T high is 800 Kelvin. 
Q high is 500 kilojoules. Then we have our heat sink. T low is 200 Kelvin. Q low is 200 kilojoules. And then we have our work net out. And the question is pretty simple. The question is, is this cycle possible? Well, so we can use the Clausius inequality to determine if this cycle is possible. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have integral of dq over t is equal to q high over t high minus q low over t low. And now all we need to do is plug in numbers and see where it falls like here. So if it's less than zero, we know it's irreversible. So it's a real process. If it's equal to zero, we know that it's ideal or it's a reversible process. If it's greater than zero, we know that it's impossible because it's going to violate the second law. And so then we know that this cycle isn't possible. So let's go ahead and plug in our numbers. So we have um, Q high is 500 kilojoules divided by T high, which is 800 Kelvin minus Q low, which is 200 kilojoules divided by T low, which is 200 Kelvin. And then this works out to negative 0 0.375. So since this is negative, we know it's possible and that this is an irreversible process or cycle or a real cycle. So what if T low was 500 Kelvin? Let's try that. So what if T low was 500 Kelvin? Basically, just go through the same math again. So we have dQ over T is equal to Q high over T high minus Q low over T low. And then this is equal to 500 kilojoules over 800 Kelvin minus 200 kilojoules over 500 Kelvin, which is equal to plus 0 0.225. Since this is positive, that means that this cycle is impossible because it's going to violate the second law.